Hi everyone, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. If you're watching it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the show, make sure to subscribe so that you get notified when a new show is released. And if you'd like to find links to videos or mp3 files, just go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com and you can also submit any eerie experiences you've had at the Submit Your Story tab. Also, hook up with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram where you can find information not only about new shows, but also about monthly free merchandise giveaways. So, get comfortable, enjoy this new episode, and just imagine it's a dark and stormy night where not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse. And if a creature is stirring, you hope it's a mouse. Hi everybody, this is Marley with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How is everybody doing today? Good, I hope. Down here in South Florida. Okay, guys, I'm going to rub it in again. It's like 75 degrees. But don't worry, when the summer rolls around and I'm steaming here, you guys will <laughs> probably be having some nice weather wherever you're at. It's any uh, north, of, uh, north of Florida. But anyway, um, before I forget, guys, don't forget... Uh, Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. You could find us on all the plot podcast platforms. You can go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, find links there, and not only to those platforms, but you can actually download the MP3 files of all the shows because I know a lot of people, this is exactly what they do so that they can listen to it. Uh, or if not, the podcast platform uh, link will take you directly to the show files. If you have a platform that you're working with, you know, that, that that's the one you like, like Spreaker, iTunes, etc. But anyway, guys, let me get to the good part. Here's the good part. The good part is the guest that I have today. And this is a gentleman by the name of Peter Robbins. And Peter, oh, I know there's a lot of you that have been asking to speak about UFOs and you know, and, and, and I had mentioned it at, on other shows that I wanted not only to bring somebody to talk about UFOs, but somebody that's very well grounded and knowledgeable because sometimes there's a lot of different theories floating out there as to extraterrestrial life, UFOs, etc. But let me tell you about Peter. He's an investigative writer, an author, and a lecturer best known for his columns, articles, radio appearances, interviews, books, and conference calls, and he's appeared as a guest on and been consultant to numerous television programs and documentaries. He's originally from Queens, New York. Um, he has studied art, design, theater. Uh, from there, he's gone on and he received his uh, uh, Bachelor's of Fine Arts at the, from New York City School of Visual Arts. Uh, and then he's gone on and he has... I mean, he's done so many things that I, I would probably use up 15 minutes of the time to talk about. He's such a well-rounded, a renaissance man, in other words. But the thing about Peter, which is, as a matter of fact, we were talking about it briefly before we started recording, is that uh, the books that he's written, the research that he's done, uh, the articles that he's written, he goes and looks up what is the truth. And... You guys know that I've mentioned this before. Uh, in this field that has become so mainstream as far as uh, UF UFOs and extraterrestrial and all this, there's a lot of truth, but there's also a lot of untruths. How's that? Uh, I do believe that it does happen. It does occur. But sometimes it is a task to actually be able to sift through what might be one of the most important truths facing humankind. Believe it or not, when you think about it, and some, unfortunately with the advent of the internet, so many shows, there's so much stuff thrown in there that getting somebody like Peter that knows what the truth is as far as actual good investigative research is concerned, this is the person to speak to. But anyway, let me bring him on. How are you doing today, Peter? Good. Thank you, Marlene. No, thank you. It is my pleasure to have you on the show. I am super thrilled. And I'm going to ask you, because I, I very briefly touched on what your background is, so I'm going to ask you, how did you end up getting involved in this field? <laughs> uh, not so much by choice as it choosing me, although people could debate that. Um, I had no interest in the subject growing up other than 
uh, being old enough to remember going to the movie theater on Saturdays uh, with my friends and watching wonderfully low-budget, black-and-white uh, B-movies with flying saucers from different places, often not very friendly. Um, but the subject itself didn't really capture my imagination. I wasn't that much into science fiction either. I had other interests as a kid, uh, a very leave it to beaver kind of childhood, not very sophisticated, growing up in a, a lovely little village about 30 miles east of Manhattan, kind of the best of both worlds there. And one um, late m summer morning uh, or um, uh, late, late spring morning, um, it was in June in the early 60s, uh, one of my sisters and I were playing out in front of the house we were growing up in front of, uh, growing up in, and um, I caught something out of my right peripheral vision in the sky. It was a perfectly blue sky, absolutely not a cloud, um, no distorted anything. It was a perfect day. And we watched as five silvery white disc-shaped objects in a very precise V-type formation uh, came flying in at high speed and simply stopped over the neighbor's house. Uh, they were metallic, not shiny like uh, stainless steel, but um, like maybe brushed aluminum, metallic but subdued. I can't tell you how big they were, but um, they were close enough that both of us could make out around the edge of each one regular detailing, which many years later when we first discussed this, uh, and there was a break of over 14 years. Um, we both agreed read visually like um, windows on a commercial airplane at an appreciable distance. Well, we looked and looked and looked, and um, I went through a reaction that um, I've since documented, I'm sure, several hundred times in investigations and interviews over the decades. I've simply come to call it the checklist reaction. Uh, you can call it what you want, but essentially it's your minding your business somewhere in the world. It's day or night, you look up and you see something or things that the one thing they or it has in common is you've never seen anything like it before. Uh, it may be violating all laws of aerodynamics, uh, have an unusual configuration, but your mind immediately starts to rattle off to you everything that it or they are not. Kites, balloons, blimps, planes, helicopters, dirigible, strange-shaped clouds, and, you know, plastic bag floating by, a reflection from the ground, and then you're kind of stuck. And that's where I was after a few moments. Um, I was 14. My life at that moment was um, basically being run by my hormones. Uh, a strong desire to be taller, have better hair, nicer clothes, be cooler kid, um, not be the king of the nerds or have to wear glasses. And I knew if I talked about this with my little junior high school buddies, what I did understand um, from the adult world was that there was ridicule attached to the subject. And um, I desperately needed to abbreviate the story some, uh, needed something to tell me that this wasn't what I thought it might be. Namely, machines from elsewhere um, under intelligent control that were unlike anything that we had. And um, at a certain point, after a minute, two minutes, a long time, and an even longer time for kids, I had had it. I was that anxious, and I went to run into the house to tell our mom, who was making lunch for us at that time, um, in the intervening years, after making this the repressed memory from childhood, which I was able to do in a matter of weeks, how we do these things, I don't know, but we do them, and this became mine. Um, my sister later that afternoon asked me if I wanted to talk about what we had seen. I said no. The years went by, and more than 14 years elapsed before this memory came roaring back into my consciousness. I can give you reasons why I think it happened, the factors that led to it breaking through at that moment. Um, the fact is it broke through. And I was so upset, within 10 minutes or so, 
it was like a tape loop. It just kept, I couldn't get it out of my head and I knew it had happened. I thought I was going crazy because I couldn't understand logically how anyone could ever put a memory like that out of their mind. And yet I had successfully done it. I had to calm myself down and think about what to do. Um, I was living in New York City's Chinatown at the time, a young painter, very excited about living that life uh, and uh, looking toward a future of being a, a well-known, well-regarded painter in New York City. My sister at the time um, was a poet um, living about a mile north of me in New York's East Village about a year or so before the whole punk music scene exploded, which she became a major part of and ended up as a uh, gold and platinum record award-winning uh, writer and uh, performer who worked with everybody and knew everybody in the field. Um, but I called her up and without feeding her any lines, I said, I've remembered something from childhood and I'm concerned if I tell you what it is to validate my memory, you'll say yes or no. And I won't really know what you remember. So I set the scene, Marlene. I gave her an idea of what the weather was, time of year, where we were standing, and she just cut me off mid-sentence laughing, said, stop, I know what you're talking about. Proceeded to tell me what I remembered with one variable that she wasn't sure of, which we resolved the next day with a drawing and a painting that I had done that afternoon. She thought it might be six, but we both remembered it as a precise D, which meant that it would be an odd number. It was five, actually. And then she said something that changed my life forever, which was but essentially, but there's more and you're not gonna like it. And again, to compress the story a bit, telling me that um, within moments of my going to run into the house, and I never quite got there, I passed out, I was knocked out, I fell down, I went unconscious, however you wanna see it. And at that moment, she said, I started to rise, to go up, to float above the house. My sister, uh, who passed away in the year 2000, and I were extremely close. Uh, we were a brother and sister, but we were very dear friends, uh, roommates over the years. We shared friends. Uh, we were both writers, edited each other's stuff. Um, she wasn't a liar, and she had no reason to make this up. This was more than 40 years ago that she told me this before UFO abductions were a subject for talk shows or more than you know, two or three books ever written, that kind of thing. And I became obsessed with the subject that very afternoon. And um, uh, yes. that is how Quite I understandable. It Had she forgotten it during this period of time or was it just you? No, no. Um, when I asked her that question, we've been going all these years, what have you thought? She said, well, I, I, probably not a day has gone by where I haven't reflected on them. And my next obvious question was, how come we never talked about this? And she said, it's simple that you remember that afternoon I came up to you and asked you if you wanted to speak about this. I said, sure, I do remember that. And she said, my feeling was, you're my brother, I love you, I respect you, you are obviously uncomfortable with this. The difference between being a 12 year old and still on the cusp of real childhood and being an insecure adolescent, you know, hormone fueled, please give me a girlfriend, God, you know, little kid, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. was all the difference in the world. That didn't fit and, in your world at that moment at all. Yeah, uh, she said, essentially one day led to the next week, led to the next month and year, and here we are. That's why we never talked about it. She never forgot it though. And um, she shared memories with me of looking down and seeing the house getting smaller for the first and last time in her life, seeing the bottom of one of these things getting bigger, and then um, having this series of memories of being walked through the hall, which was metal, uh, by a number of beings. This was years before even the term gray was used to delineate that specific type of being that, you know, everybody, most folks can right. visualize in mind when I say that. Um, but she remembered being walked through a hallway by a bunch of these little beings and one that looked like the rest but was considerably taller that she understood was the leader, so to say. She remembers being on the metal table, and the description of that is, is always um, within parameters the same. And um, using, basically describing it from the memory of herself at 12 years old, and not having the words in our culture yet to say, oh, they were a bunch of greys, 
she said they were like little doctors with big heads and big black eyes and they talked to me in my head and she told me some of the things that she heard them say or the big ones say and all i can tell you is that in the intervening decades as an investigator um, i have heard not just similar accounts but basically the same account and often with some of the exact same terminology um, at some point some years ago this stopped being an obsession and something that i just continued to do because i felt it was important work i was fairly good at communicating it and doing the research um, but it can be trying at times and um, what it's all leading to we can only make our best educated guesses but this is an incredibly important subject and its implications for humanity of truly anomalous ufos and their occupants is off the charts how do you think that that event affected your sister uh was it something like she said that she thought about every day uh, yeah well i can tell you because she told me um some of the things that she heard in her head were you're special we've seen you before we'll see you again um, we love you we will not hurt you for her I think a certain amount of her uh, take on these beings and whatever they're about was formed in a moment where there was um, a message that conflicted with itself when she heard the big one she assumed say in her head telepathically we will not hurt you she was experiencing pain at that moment from whatever procedure or exam okay. uh, protocol they were doing uh, she was not fond of them um, okay. she was i said well how did you feel basically just thinking about them in all those intervening years not sharing it she said essentially i felt special and that was that wasn't a bad thing um, however, the anger involved in yes. doing that to a little kid, mm -hmm. uh, even though there is an unnatural lack of fear, even rising, and we, we hear this over and over and over, it makes no sense. Um, you're rising to a point where if gravity took over, you would die, and possibly very frightening, you know, painful at the mo last moment. But there was none of that. It was just, gee, isn't this interesting? This is fascinating. It's the way it works. They seem to have the power to do this. Um, but when her anger and resentment as an adult right. kind of emerged and she made contact with it, being an artist and at that moment transitioning from being a poet to being a songwriter uh, and ultimately a, a very uh, a beloved performer in the greater New York area and beyond, um, she, her music, which was mostly in the punk genre, um, had a lot of anger to it. And she talked about this episode in music business publications. Um, at one point she had an image of cows being, you know, lifted off the ground on the back of one of her albums, that kind of thing. Um, she was very much an advocate for people who were abductees. She was a, uh, original member of uh, Bud Hopkins, uh, who is um, a name some of your listeners will be familiar with. He is um, mm -hmm. the, essentially the founder of the School of Rational Scientific Research into this aspect of UFO studies. And I uh, was lucky enough to call him a friend for 35 years and was his assistant for almost about half that time. So, um, when I first met Bud about a year after this thing emerged for my sister and I as a memory and my life changed about it considerably, I then met Bud and uh, he was the first person to develop support groups for people that had had these kind of experiences and do his best to help educate uh, around the subject and uh, be there as a resource for folks who had had these experiences. Right, because this I imagine was also the time where very few people, if any, would talk about having an abduction experience. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. The This brings us almost immediately to how tightly wired up um, ridicule is with 
the subject of UFOs. And the way I sometimes try to express it is in what we'll laughingly call a relatively sane world, which we don't really live in. Um, if you and I, you know, were neighbors and we ran into each other on the street and I said, hey, Marlene, how you doing? I got to tell you something. Last night or this afternoon, um, I was, you know, cooking up a steak in the backyard or playing with the kids or walking the dog. And I looked up and I saw this thing or things and I had never seen anything like it before. And I uh, did this or did that. Um, it, I, I don't know what it was. And I, I just haven't been able to stop thinking about it since. In a relatively sane world, you would either say to me or think, I'm going to make an educated guess. Gee, that's interesting. I wonder what it was to end of story, right? Right. Wrong. <laughs> we are wired up, most of us in our culture, to hear somebody say something like that. And I'll say it's diminished over the years, but it's still um, a, a genuine major uh, situation we deal with of, okay, I just heard Peter say that. What is wrong with him? Is he having a mental episode? Is he uh, going mystical on me? Is he hallucinating? Yeah. Is he on drugs? <laughs> is he um, on drugs, right? <laughs> is, he, is he trying to fool me? Um, maybe he thinks that, you know, this is a way to be famous. Maybe he's going to angle to make money. Why? In other words, everything except what's right in front of your face. Um, how did that happen? It makes no sense whatsoever. How did our world get wired up like that? Well, it happened in the summer of 1947, and it happened because of um, an indoctrination program, so to say, that was led by our major media, which at the time was newspapers, major newspapers, mm -hmm. which for their own reasons, probably, if anything, quietly encouraged by um, certain working groups within the United States government, um, began to do just that. It can't be, therefore it isn't, therefore it's something else. And anybody that takes this seriously is a fool or a con person or a mystic. There's nothing to it, folks. And the extraordinary efforts that mainstream media and the Air Force, which just came into existence, the Air Force came into existence literally um, two months after the whole UFO subject first was born into our culture with two events. One, uh, a sighting by a private pilot and businessman in Washington State on June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold flying his plane in the Cascade Mountain Range. And then about a week and a half later, with the discovery of a debris field on a ranch um, some miles outside of the then fairly small, quiet town of Roswell, New Mexico. And then the reports started to come in from all over the United States from credible witnesses and within a week or so other countries as well. And we were smack in the middle of the beginning of the modern age of UFOs. But that ridicule factor is still with us. And I make a, uh, yes. a certain uh, effort to help people to understand what actually happened that summer and how we and our parents and our grandparents were really sold a bill of goods. I will also say, Marlene, that as somebody that is kind of a lightning rod for people contacting about this subject, I've got to tell somebody about my experience yes. who won't laugh at me, or I just wanted to verify something with you or ask you a question about an article you wrote, or can I have a word with you at a conference? Every year, yes. more and more people care less and less what other people think about what they think about this subject. And that's a good thing. Right. And interestingly, millennials and younger folks are born into uh, an understanding that, of course, this is probably real. And of course, the government covers it up. And what else is new? I've got other things that I have to deal with on my mind. It's a whole different take on it, but it's integrated. For folks who are now, you know, in early retirement age or coming to it or in their 60s, 70s, 80s, who are lucky enough to, um, you know, have a little discretionary spending and paying their bills and now able to do things that they put off 10 years ago who wouldn't have been caught dead at a UFO conference well, or mentioning the subject at a dinner party are now, yeah. God, I, oh, no, 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 it's changed. Me. Want to fight about this? <laughs> well, no, I, I belong to a UFO awareness uh, club here in Miami. 
And, you know, I've gone to some meetings and like you said, a lot of the people there, they're retired, not necessarily older, just they belong to the ex-military, ex-police. Sure. And, Good they, for them. and during those years, it was a career killer. If you yeah. ever said That's anything. Right. And now they are among the most interested and outspoken. And now they're, they're coming yeah. because it's like, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> OK, <laughs> but it was understood. It was an unspoken. Yeah. That's and right. it would never be official, but that you wanted to stop your career right where it was That's at. It. That's it. All you had to do it's... was hint or even go to somebody and say, hey, uh, I, I saw that it was, it was like, you know, it got around. Don't just shut up. That's right. That's right. Um, again, one of, as I mentioned to you before we went on the air, I had three real mentors, uh, remarkable men who helped me to become the person I am in this work. One was, um, when I met him, he was already in his 70s. He was uh, a, a former staff officer for the Royal Hungarian Army in World War II. He was one of the officers who oversaw Hungary's part in the war. Hungary, who had been uh, the country, um, had been kind of seduced into an anti-communist pact, terrible fears by the Germans, woke up one day and realized, oh my God, we're on Hitler's side. Uh, Coleman von Kavetsky was his name, and he was in charge of all photo reconnaissance and photo analysis for the Hungarian military during the war. Uh, so I, I learned a, a fair amount from him. Uh, the other was a, a wonderful guy who died much too young. Pete Mazzola was a tough, no-nonsense, Italian-American, Brooklyn, New York City police detective, wounded in the line of duty a number of times, also a crack UFO investigator who took a little good-natured kidding here and there from his brother officers and detectives, but he was a really good cop. And he was the first person I knew who he had been trained by the New York City, uh, through the New York City Police Department to conduct regressive hypnosis in criminal investigations. One of only a few people with the NYPD to do so. But he was the first person I knew to use that skill to conduct regressive hypnosis with UFO abductees and experiencers. And now, if you were to uh, want to get um, not polygraph, but voice stress analysis technology, you can get it for your computer. Back then, it was fairly large, bulky uh, technology at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice here in New York, but they let him use it to check the stress level of people uh, who had had these experiences. And then the other was a painter like myself, who became the finest self-trained investigative writer detective I ever knew, and who wrote a tremendous hundreds of articles, probably in monographs and conference papers and uh, a handful of remarkably important books. That's Bud Hopkins. Um, so I was very fortunate in my uh, ability to come into this work grounded and well-taught and to be able to continue my own education, so to say, on my own, uh, with proper grounded values. It never, for me, has been about, well, how can I put it? Uh, I've screwed up massively in that one of the things that some people know me best for is having um, co-authored what a lot of folks felt was a very important book about Britain's best known UFO incident, the so-called Rendlesham Forest incident. Um, which um, the book is called Left at East Gate, and, and uh, you can find it online. But it turned out about three years ago, um, a scandal erupted around that book, and rightly so, because my co-author, allegedly a witness to the event, turned out to be um, wow. essentially a sociopath who created his part in it and convinced me uh, of his efficacy and involvement, which I... Uh, <laughs> took and ran with um, and I've spent the last year and a half of my professional life apologizing for and rebooting my career. What I'm saying here is belief works when it's supported by evidence and you have to dig deep sometimes. Also, I wouldn't have known it. I wouldn't have believed it beforehand, but some people simply don't tell the truth and they, they do it very well. Uh, it's definitely exception to the rule and the overwhelming number of individuals I'm convinced that I have dealt with, known, uh, worked with over the decades have been 
as presented uh, and fully authentic. We're dealing with something real here. And to quote a gentleman named um, um, Twining, um, uh, a Air Force general, Nathan M. Twining, in a very early September 1947 secret document, uh, the phenomena reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious, end quote. Peter, let me ask something. When that happened in Roswell, and of course, I know what you're saying as far as disinformation, do you think that our government, I want to say Amer the American government because it happened in the United States, was already aware of UFOs? Or were they also caught off guard because of the crash site and they just scrambled to That's a great question. disguise it because, okay, so be, yeah. we need to figure this out, but yeah. we just know we can't let the public know about it. I, I There are two decided schools of thought in this. Um, there is some documentation, although I don't know if it's fully authentic. It may well be okay. showing that going back to the early 40s, that there was an awareness of this presence uh, under the Roosevelt administration. But um, if it was, if there was, the information was held by a, I'm making an educated guess here, a very small number of individuals within the military and intelligence community. Um, in June of 47, with the advent of the Kenneth Arnold sighting uh, in late June, and then for that next week and a half or so until this debris field was reported by the ranch foreman, Mac Brazel, to the base, and then um, Jesse Marcel, uh, the base intelligence officer and another officer went out to check out the debris field for themselves. In that intervening week already, you can bet things were buzzing in Washington. Um, I'm comfortable with either one of those theories, but um, again, even if there was knowledge of it before the, the summer of 1947, it was held in a very, very limited circle where that summer, that circle expanded. And uh, President Truman, um, I'm convinced, quickly brought in a working group of a dozen of the best minds that he could get hold of in various areas of logical study and um, uh, areas as diverse as military technology, uh, psychology, um, um, the effect it would have on um, uh, our society, et cetera, to pull the wagons into the circle, so to say, and figure out what had happened. Uh, having read a great deal about Truman and, and by Truman, I have a very strong feeling that had he asserted himself more, been left more to his own devices, or not listened so uh, respectfully to the advice of some of his advisors, after six months or so, he might well have simply gone on radio and said, my fellow Americans and citizens of the world, it is my solemn duty to let you know, blah, blah, blah. Can we even imagine? Well, how you know the what? And, and the reason why I asked you that is that you remember when Orson Welles did that radio yes, of War of the, the Worlds, that there yes. were people running around like yes. the end of well, the world was taking place. Well, that's an area of study that I have also delved into deeply. And you're talking about, of course, the Mercury Theater yes, uh, exactly. uh, of the air. Um, broadcast of an Americanized, compressed version of H.G. Wells' classic yes. science fiction story, War of the Worlds, that was broadcast October 30th, the night before Thanksgiving, 1938. This was within a month of the beginning of World War II in Europe, and America was on edge. Right. And if you read the studies of this, it's, you know, in a Mr. Spock kind of chin-rubbing, eyebrow-raising fascinating Captain Way, it is fascinating because mm -hmm. they were able to calibrate, um, you know, phone depots, phone lines that got overloaded. Yes, uh, exactly. The heart attack here, the stroke there. People on Manhattan Island making their way to the Hudson River to see New Jersey in flames. Yes. And yet, even though several weeks were compressed into that broadcast, 
which should have been a cue to listeners. They missed and that. <laughs> they there missed were commercials, that. folks. If the Mars are they, really attacking, they probably won't have commercials. You know what? Um, I want to say there was an innocence about the population. Yes. Well, exactly, Marlene. Exactly. However, um, that case and that event is occasionally still put forward. And you know what? Partly rightly so. To say the public isn't ready. They're going to panic, at least a segment of them are. You know what? A segment of them will. One of the challenges, I think, for myself and my colleagues, for people like you who are open-minded, and um, even if we don't know the absolutes and the details, except the reality of this possibility, and many of your listeners, is we tend to forget or completely ignore the fact that even though we are, in so many words, ready, or ready enough for the announcement to be made, we represent a very modest segment of the American population and the world at large. But the illusion is, if you know, I, I go to different conferences and speak for groups and talk to people, I have a very distorted picture of the world on a certain level. It seems that everybody knows and everybody's ready, but it's not true. And I do have colleagues who could care less. It's just, they'll get used to it. You know, power to the people, release everything now, disclosure. Yeah. Exactly. I'm but not, It's got to be managed. It's got to be thought yes. through. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube once it's out. Oh, and no. you well, can't just say we're not alone because what, what, what would people do? People would just what sit in there. Think about it. Even though we've been acclimated because of entertainment, movies, etc. Let's say yeah. versus 1947. Still, I think like you said, some people think of it as like, yeah, OK, it might be true. But if it ever really happened, like a saucer landed on the front lot of the White House or they actually came out and admit, I think there would be people that would just like stay in their house and have a few drinks and then think, now what? I'm not going to work. No, more than a few drinks, possibly. Uh, <laughs> and you're right. There would be a segment of the people. Also, there is um, a segment of the research community that for decades was what's going to happen for the people of faith and the religious communities. Oh, well, some of them will freak the hell out. Churches Other ones, would be overrun, I'll tell you that much right yeah, now. Well, yeah, it would be a good day to be in the church business. Yeah. Otherwise, though, uh, not to be facetious, it is, there's so many unpredictable aspects to it. Yes. Um, number one, as um, one of the best known and most respected and beloved uh, ufologist ever, who has only recently begun to go into retirement, that is Stanton Friedman, who has been doing this work for over 50 years, a distinguished, now retired nuclear physicist, who um, is very, very nuts and bolts and very pragmatic, and as a result, uh, somebody who a lot of us look up to. One of um, uh, the propositions that he put forward many years ago that captured my thinking was the name of the game for world governments here is not kumbaya and bringing all the people of the world together and, you know, no more wars and things. It's I want to get my hands on this hardware because if I can back engineer it and create a new super weapon, we win. We yes. win. For them, that's it. The other aspect is just an appreciable uh, announcement where people can say, oh, my God, the government's saying this is true. They have technology that's so advanced we can't even think about it, mm -hmm. but they have power sources that could do away with pollution and uh, all kinds of fossil fuels. And even the stuff that we think of as cutting edge renewable energy, I've got, we've got to have that. That could cause indirectly a crash in an, part of the stock market. Oh, yeah. um, as Bud used to say, um, church attendance would go up mental institution uh, acceptances of new inmates would go up, alcohol sales would go up, uh, people Absolutely. buying Absolutely. a lot more guns and bullets would go up. Yes. Uh, so for all of the, the talk of, you know, wonder and goodness, um, yes. we have a problem. Now, that doesn't preclude the fact that we have a growing disclosure-oriented community worldwide. Um, and I think that's a great thing. It's, for me, the, the individual emblematic um, who is right now in the forefront of this is a guy named Steve Bassett. Stephen is one of the most dedicated people I've ever known about anything. And he has been 
out there for years, actively traveling around and helping to organize, not just in this country, but worldwide, small working groups of regular folks who get together and at the least help to educate each other to the reality of this, help to educate the people around them to build more and more of a critical mass of people that take this seriously worldwide. I think if we're looking to the American government, you know, under this president, the last president, the next president say, okay, you know, just had too many petitions, we give up. Here's the lowdown. Um, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, we have been leading the charge of liars in this since the summer of 1947. Do you, do you and, think that presidents, and, and I mean since the 47, do you think a lot yeah. of them were in ignorance or were given very limited information to begin with? I love that question. Um, I think because this information has been held by people who are not elected uh -huh. and yes. kind of transmute from one generation to the next, we don't know their names or we don't know, we don't know for sure that we know their names, some of them, um, that every new president is perceived by this group, military, intelligence, and otherwise, and now probably with a certain amount of input from multinational corporation leaders yes. who also have a stake in the game sure. um, to know something. But they are told whatever, you know, maybe this is a, a term where we could, can use that overused, highly theatricalized term, deep state, that right. um, for me, the secret government, whatever, uh, that every president is given the information that these individuals want them to have, and the rest is withheld. We can make certain logical deductions. Truman knew everything there was to know because he was there right. when the whole thing exploded around him. Eisenhower was probably very heavily briefed. He was uh, highly respected by the military intelligence community. He was a former commanding general of the United States Army in Europe, uh, and he was very popular with most of the public. He probably was well briefed. Um, John Kennedy, having uh, absolutely made the um, intelligence community furious at him for not following through on Eisenhower's much regretted uh, uh, plan to invade Cuba and the Bay of Pigs, pushed on him by the Dulles brothers, um, was probably told very little, but probably knew a lot because he was from an incredibly connected family and had his own sources of information. And so it goes. Um, I, I can only make guesses after that. What right. President Obama was told, I don't know. What um, um, the current president, President Trump, knows or doesn't know, we can also only guess at. But I think that each president knows enough to know that they are hoping that this doesn't explode into public awareness while they are president. I, I think that is one of the jobs of the intelligence community to make them, if they have any thoughts otherwise, to shut up and just keep your attention someplace else. Right. We know that um, Jimmy Carter had a very well uh, publicized UFO sighting while running for office and that he wanted this to come out, but once he became president, that was the end of that. He began to think otherwise. Same thing for President Reagan in overdrive. He had at least one, possibly two, real UFO events in his life. And we know this for a fact, one of them very well uh, promoted. With um, uh, Clinton, there was always the suggestion that he was an insider and knew something. And with Hillary, the teasing thing of, you know, I do know something. If I'm elected, you know, I'll, I'll say something about it. You know, I, I think it was just campaign nonsense. But they all have been briefed or not briefed to some degree. Right. We can only make guesses about. Yeah. And do you think, Peter, that the technological advances we made, whether it's in aeronautics or even in weapons, is due to information or technology we've gotten from extraterrestrials? Or is that just simply us being smart? I, another wonderful question that um, I don't know the answer to, but I'll tell you what I think. Okay. Um, the the whole idea of the term in popular culture now is back engineering. Mm -hmm. um, flashes me back to an original uh, Star Trek episode where um, 
I think it's McCoy leaves a phaser on a planet they've just visited. It's a famous episode, The Planet of the Chicago Gangsters. Right, Love yes. it. Uh, yes. And in the last minute, um, uh, Kirk uh, uh, Spock observed that, you know, the core of our technology is caught up in this phaser. They're smart. They'll take it apart in 100 years. They'll be in the star system, you know, wanting right. to shake down the planets and blah, blah, blah. Funny ending. Um, I believe there have been actual crashes that this technology is not perfect, that um, even though we don't seem to have developed a way to take them down militarily, accidents happen, electrical sure. storms are theorized, that there may well have been back engineering of some of these craft, for lack of a better word, and we may have learned quite a bit. Uh, I had a wonderful ongoing dialogue with Bud Hopkins about this, both of us big fans of humanity at our best, uh, and both of us born into a world where radios had, you know, tubes in them and kids didn't have video games and it was a simpler place. Could we have gotten from there to here on our own? In other words, could we have made the jump over the past 50 years from analog to digital technology? I think we may well have. Uh, at the same time, one wonders. Um, the whole advent of the internet, the whole yes. advent of fiber optics, of um, microchips. I, I try, like... microchips, all of this stuff. Um, we are at our best a brilliant species. And as an old employer of mine used to say, it, what the, in so many words, what the mind of man can conceive, it can achieve. Now I will say mankind or men and women. But I have no problem with either one. So. Yeah. Um, I'm damned if I know. If I learned that certain technological advances, I indeed, we have empirical court-level proof to show that we made that jump because of back engineering, I won't lose a moment to sleep and say it makes sense to me. If it could be established that we absolutely did this all on our own, in tandem with the fact that we came into an age where we are interfacing with intelligences from parts unknown or mm -hmm. beings that have always been here with us one dimension away that may be sitting right there in your lovely room and right here with yeah, me right I, now I just uh, enjoying our conversation and with us in Simon Memorial um, we can only make educated guesses exactly. I keep going back to the iconic poster that for many of us is emblematic of one of the most popular relevant television shows of all time, um, uh, The X-Files, the poster says, I want to believe. And isn't that the story of so many of us? I want to believe that this is not happening. I want to believe it is happening. I want to believe if it is happening, they're all good. I want to believe if they're all good, they're especially good to me. Uh, and that they'll clean up all the pollution and the uh, rancor in the world, et cetera. And, right, and, right, the and, happy ending. but. How about what Hawkins was saying towards the end before, you know, a little bit before he died, where we had to be very careful about that face-to-face, uh, -face, that, that close encounter, per se, because we might come in on the short end of that stick? Yeah. Um, well, let me preface that by saying, after more than 40 years, many of which have been immersed in this subject, in studies, in uh, investigation, in networking with people, in being out in the field and being in archives. I know at this point how little I really know. I know for a fact, as well as I can know it, we're not alone in the universe. Right. In fact, deductive reasoning suggests to me that the universe is teeming with life, even if much of it is very basic. But those building blocks are there. We now know from even the most conservative um, members of the astronomical community that there are millions of situations out there where we have a planet about the size of Earth, about the same distance from a star about the size of the sun. Now, if you're a person of faith, you can say, well, you know, here it is, the um, basic building blocks for God's firmament and life emerging in another corner of the cosmos. If you are either agnostic or very scientific in your thinking and not influenced by the idea of a supreme being, you can say, well, there you go. We have the, um, the scientific conditions necessary to produce 
the basic building blocks to produce that little one-celled animal that sooner or later is going to become a two-celled animal, and off we go to the races again. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think that it it could be manifestations of both ideas. Um, At the same time, the one thing that almost fascinates me in terms of its, um, I won't even say ignorance, it's a willful resistance to the overwhelming factual nature of all of the the factors that suggest to us that we're not alone. Um, And again, for me, the mantra there, and I'm not talking about skeptics here, Marlene, you and I, as people who are in this work and have a public presence, it's part of our obligation to be skeptical. Yes. And to the degree that we're not, we can uh, be messed with or fooled um, or uh, rely on belief rather than evidence to move forward and suggest something is so. Um, But I completely just lost my train of thought there. Um, Well, no, no, as far as being skeptical about. Oh, yeah, what I'm going to say is skepticism is different than being a debunker. Interesting word, which is uh, the difference of night and day. A debunker is somebody who simply knows that we're wrong. How do they know it? Because what we're proposing, that we're not alone in the universe, And by extension, that there are advanced intelligences visiting us without any impunity, coming and going in very advanced technology for reasons we can only guess at. It can't be. Therefore, it isn't. Therefore, it's something else. So what they see as their mandate here uh, is not even to prove or disprove it. It obviously doesn't exist. We're wrong. How do they know it? because they're just amazing and they're so smart. Um, And so they um, insult all of us by reducing it to, you're either, you know, you're kind of a mystic, you're sort of a dreamer, you're a hippie, you just want to believe that, you know, there are aliens coming and going because it's so romantic and cool, but you're wrong. We, you know, we're pragmatic people here and, and we know it can't be. So listen to us, pat on the head. Yeah, well. I mean, I think on the contrary, I think people that think like that in reality, playing it safe, because if they open that door just a little bit, you never know what's going to be on the other side of that. Well, I think in many cases they're dealing with either consciously or unconsciously their own anxieties, fears, longings, terrors. Um, If this is true, there are some people and I, I don't I get it and I don't get it in who follow certain religious traditions. Wonderful for them, good. Um, where they feel somehow that if there are, if there is life out there, and it conflicts in some way with teachings in their holy scripture, um, the problem here doesn't have to do with any particular religion. It has to do with fundamentalist thinking, which means I am completely unbending and rigid. There is no interpretation. There is no series of ways to look at this. It is what it is, and that is what I say it is. And if you say it's otherwise, you're a blasphemer, um, you're an infidel, um, you are an enemy of my religion, you're, you know, somebody who doesn't believe in or hates God, and it's spun completely out of control. I think that is one of the tragedies of humanity, religion, which should be at the core of so much that is good and so much of um, what should serve humanity. Uh, Growing up in the Reformed Jewish tradition, I was taught that God was love. I wasn't stuck with a lot of dogma, and I'm very thankful uh, for that. Um, I understood that the Bible was written by real people. Sure. but also that it was a combination of actual accounts of things that happened, of um, the rewriting of earlier myths, of morality tales, things we could learn from that were written in a manner to learn a lesson, not so much because they were true, but because they helped us understand something. It was a message. All now, for some people, um, they would consider me absolutely um, a, a traitor to God or um, somebody who 
does not understand the nature of the Bible. It was written by God himself with his giant gold fountain pen. And I'm sorry if that sounds cavalier. <laughs> no, but, 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 you know, I mean. But and, and you know what? You you remember that you're back in the 70s or 60s when you were a square guy. You know, you're square. Well, but this is what they are. They want to live in that square. And if you tilt it a little bit, then their world not only from the yeah. religious point of view as far as their belief systems can go yeah. on its side but then you think of it if you're thinking of let's say in the terms of god being a creator yeah this should expand your horizons as in he Thank is you. the creator hello exactly there, there it goes the miracle of creation extends out yes. to the ends of the cosmos yes. so that should only increase one's faith in exactly. a divine presence unfortunately this is not the way it is. And when I first got involved in the work and just, you know, power to the people and reveal everything now and tell us what's going on and stop the secrecy and all this, I, I, I was fairly short tempered with a lot of these folks and, you know, got into a lot of people's faces and got in arguments and things about it. Over the years, um, I've come to understand that for most folks, who take a very contrary or aggressively um, uh, different view on this subject. You know, you're all just crazy and you're all living in science fiction and, you know, you just want to escape the problems that we humans have caused and, you know, think of these aliens going to come and help you and it's just not the way it is. Um, I, I think behind a lot of that thinking is understandable anxiety, confusion, even fear in cases. So, I choose to not get in people's faces about it, to have compassion, to try to understand yes. and to remember how challenging this subject is. I remember how challenging it was for me the first year or two. I had to find a therapist to help me get wrap my head around the idea that this was really a fact and that something like this had happened to my sister and happened to other real people and that we were not alone and I found a, a brilliant brilliant um, uh, psychiatrist who did take the subject seriously and helped me immensely to normalize my attitude about it and then get to work in this world, in this subject, without a lot of internal conflict uh, about the basics regarding it. Well, and you know, now that you mentioned that, Peter, because I'm a trained hypnotherapist myself and I've worked with people who had done exactly what you described where they have forgotten certain things yeah. and people don't realize you know because everybody thinks of that as amnesia and it's not necessarily amnesia but usually our minds will do this if we're not ready at that moment yeah to take it in that's right and eventually like it happened with you it either comes back yeah. all at once or it'll drift in because maybe then at that moment is when you were ready and, and i'll tell you um to go back to what we were first talking about, um, why did this awareness come back to me when it did after yes. more than 14 years? Um, off the top of my head, several reasons. Um, number one, um, I lived in New York's Chinatown at the time, okay. and Chinese New Year's in February. And in the old days, before um, Mayor Giuliani outlawed, well, fireworks were outlawed, but he cracked down on the Chinese community about it. They had always looked the other way. It's a 6,000 year old tradition for God's sakes. And yes. a lot of us miss it. You know, sparklers are not the same thing. No. <laughs> but living in the heart of that community during that particular new year of, uh, I think 1975, for two or three days, you really don't sleep. Um, you walk in the streets and you're only not smelling Chinese food, but cordite, you know, from exploded firecrackers yeah, I think my cat had a nervous breakdown. I mean, it was just a lot of noise and kept me up. Number two, um, I had at that point in my life immersed myself in a number of human potential workshops, as we used to call them. Okay. And I had one um, a week or so before that opened me up to a degree that I had not been. And it was um, just very interesting uh, uh, for me. The other thing... Um, was as a artist. Um, I didn't grow up at a time when parents necessarily saved every little drawing by their little genius and put it on the refrigerator. Uh, I don't yes. think we had re invented refrigerator magnets yet, so that uh -huh. gallery was not available. But um, at 
a year or so before that, my grandmother, who is a New Yorker, surprised me out of the blue, gave me several dozen drawings I had done from about the age of 14 back to about the age of six that I, I didn't even know still existed. And it was a revelation to me as an artist to see these works, most of which I remembered immediately when I looked at them. And um, a former girlfriend of mine who was um, remained friends, she um, did something quite wonderful. She took them all and put them in acetate with using electrical tape, because some of them are on manila paper, very fragile. I had just been going through them and was looking at drawings that I did, having nothing to do with the subject, but I had done within a few months at 14 years old of this memory, uh, having the, the reality having happened. And I think it all conspired together. Now, talking about um, regressive hypnosis, when this memory came back, I didn't need regressive hypnosis. It just no. came roaring to my head. However, um, over the next few years, as I became aware of this as a tool, and two of my mentors were also credentialed in doing regressive hypnosis, Hopkins and Detective Sergeant Mazzola, I waited until I was good and ready. And then over the course of the year, I underwent regressive hypnosis with both of them and a third uh, practitioner. Why? Because I wondered if what had happened to my sister had happened to me. I don't mm -hmm. think so. I'm convinced not. And the other thing was to see if anything new would come up. And I was ready. You know better than most people that people experience regressive hypnosis in different ways. If yes. you're going into it, you're still very anxious. You'll give them devices. Um, uh, with Pete, I remember him saying this was in the front of the house. If you were in your parents' bedroom, you could look down and see yourself and your sister. Then I want you to have re-experience this when you need to, to just jump back and you're in the bedroom looking down and remembering that it all is past. I was ready for these things, and I experienced it in total alpha state. I was 14 again. It was actually one of the most moving experiences of my life. I was 14. I smelled the grass. I was using words and phrases that I hadn't used, you know, in a decade and a half. Mm -hmm. I was perceiving my whole reality in that framework of being under, there's a part of you that knows. It's hard to explain, but it's like willful dreaming. I know I'm having this dream and I could wake up now, but I don't have to, and I'm just gonna let it keep happening. Right. All I can tell you was that it was joyous. And when I, I haven't listened to the tapes in years, but the phraseology and that I was wearing a polo shirt instead of a t-shirt. I was wearing dungarees instead of jeans. I was wearing my Keds. It was pretty amazing. You know what? And I was, when you were telling me that story at the beginning, I was dying to ask you what was going on with you at that time. Because I know there had to have been something that just brought this avalanche forward. I mean, some people do it slowly. Yeah. Sometimes they sure. start with weird dreams. But in your yeah. case, you had this... I think Moment. it was those three things. I think it was those three factors. I was overtired, but I think there was a fourth factor, and it's more important than any of the others, which is my mind was ready to deal with it. Yes, the lid exactly. could come yes. off the garbage can, and I could make yes. some sense of it and wrap my head around it after 14 and a half years for reasons, who knows? But no, that's the yeah, way every, we do it. Every, everybody's internal psyche is different. Yeah, like I said, and some people, by the way, never get to where you got. Some people will go their whole lifetimes yeah. without recovering that memory because they're just never going to. If they ever recover it, it will damage oh, them. They'll that's stop right. Functioning. The, so yeah, the free floating anxiety, mm -hmm. or yes. that they are aware, but they live in terror, oh, yeah. or at least fear of being exposed or exposing themselves. One of um, our leading voices in abduction studies, who's kind of semi-retired now, Dr. David Jacobs, uh, retired pro associate professor of history at Temple University in Philadelphia for many years, wrote a number of books on abduction. And one of them, <clears throat> the first one, I believe, um, the title was Secret Life. And it says it very well. The idea of this is the one thing, more than anything, I don't want anybody to know about me because if they thought for a moment that I actually believed that something like this would happen to me, mm -hmm. it would fracture my relationship with them tremendously or destroy it. I can't take that risk. So I prefer 
I, I walk around with um, quite a number of confidences in my head. Um, the hundreds of cases I work closely with Bud Hopkins on, the ones on my own, uh, people who have confided things to me. And a fraction of all of that involves a number of public people people who are actually well-known or what we call famous, who either they or their children had experiences like we're talking about and that fear of having their public life um, sullied by, muddied by, uh, mixed up with this crazy subject, it has um, not been good for relationships in some cases between children and parents. Um, I'm familiar with a number of them in the performing world, the world of politics, the world of um, um, writing um, every kind of artist imaginable, and um, who have, you know, looked for support and treatment, um, a community, so to say, or at least a validation that they're not out of their minds. Um, of and, you know, I will always keep those confidences. It, it, there's no area of, of humanity, um, whether it's socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, um, financial, um, religious, that this subject and these experiences do not touch. Of course, and you have to understand, Peter, sometimes for somebody, let's say somebody that doesn't have to per se worry about if they're well known or how it's going to influence their, their public persona, it's for some people, and I'm talking an abduction scenario, admitting this to themselves is, what if it will happen to me again? Can they do this to me again? Yeah. Even as an adult, some people, this, they, cannot, they cannot function with that possibility of being part of their world. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I have to say, although um, I am a sympathetic uh, compassionate person. Um, I have a lot of empathy. Um, I have a good imagination. Um, however, even having interfaced with hundreds, hundreds of people who I am convinced are authentic experiencers, abductees, have had profoundly life-changing sightings, um, it's still difficult for me with an account like my sister's, a very basic abduction account or fragments mm -hmm. thereof, no matter how many times I've heard it, no matter how detailed the accounts have been, no matter how close I've gotten to the individuals involved, what ev evidences have been presented, I don't know. I know I don't know how I would react in a situation like that. Uh, for all, all of my um, knowledge or experience, without a direct experience, I might just freak the hell out and never want to have anything to do with this subject again. Well, Why because not? you have to understand that this this takes you, let's say as a human being, from the top of the food chain. When I mean the food chain, as in kings of the world, yeah. we have whole dominion over everything and all, and you know, life to, it flips it on its head. Now we're at the bottom where we could be plucked, okay, away, so we, it, it, for some people, that going from the top to the bottom. <laughs> well, Marlene, you're, you're onto something terribly important here. And in all seriousness, uh, I think it is one of um, the roots that hold denial in place. That for anybody growing up in the so-called Judeo-Christian tradition, mm -hmm. um, we are allegedly made in God's image. Right. Well, if we're made in God's image, whose image are they made in? And if we were brought up to understand that we are the ultimate manifestation of creation in terms of complexity and, um, you know, we're the kings and queens of the world. We roll domain over all of the other living creatures. Not doing a very good job of it, actually. Yeah. But, um, but we're, still, all of a we're sudden, still there. You know? <laughs> it, Unfortunately, again, yeah. If you have even a remotely fundamentalist point of view of just a set inflexible set of rules, logic, understandings, laws of the universe, laws of God, etc., sitting there in front of you, this challenges them all. Yes. And if this is the way it is, 
I, I can't even begin to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. Therefore, it's the devil's work. Um, and fundamentalists often, I'm sorry to say, and the religion doesn't matter, will say, you know, this is Satan trying to fool us. And I have had a number of um, respectful debates with uh, colleagues who um, do identify themselves as fundamentalist Christians, and they've got it all covered. I mean, any question that I've been able to pose for them, they've got the answer, which works for them. You know, what about objects that we track coming in from really deep space? Well, you know, Satan understands this and, you know, understands that this and it's, there's no real argument because it's a totally self-sustaining belief system and every defense is in place. So as Tony Soprano would say, what are you going to do? Well, see, this is this is where the horizon, there is no line on the horizon. It gets misty and you don't know what's on, off that horizon. <laughs> that's exactly what we're looking at. Well said. Uh, are, are we, is it oppressive? Well, I mean, and that's where people like that misty edge of the horizon, like, oh, and some people, and I understand that. I understand that because, as God knows, we we're we're all busy multitasking day to day. So, uh, thinking about the reality, the possibility, the hard, hard possibility that this is true. Uh, I, I'm I believe that even the sanest human being would probably uh, like just I don't want to say pass out, but they'd pr better have a chair close by because. And then it would be all downhill depending on your psychological makeup and yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but I personally, I think it's very exciting, scary sometimes, especially, yeah. <laughs> but very exciting because... Um, it is very exciting. It is. It I is very exciting. Is. I'd like to think that there will come a time in the future, long after we're gone, where humanity, if there's anybody left, and we're not just, you know, grunting mutant creatures from the last nuclear war, but that we manage not to destroy ourselves and our planet, there will come a time in the future when humanity will look back on this period, the latter part of the 20th, the earlier part of the 21st century, and say there were people there who basically um, had an opportunity to live uh, um, enjoyable lives with all of their needs covered and uh, um, not have put themselves on the spot but they did the hard work, they did the research, they did the investigation that created a critical mass that ultimately, when the truth became known, however it did, enough of us were prepared to help educate the other people, and we know their names, and you know we study them in school, and we're thankful that they did what they did with their lives. I'd like to think that time will come and that some of the real pioneers in this work will be acknowledged then for the sacrifices they made. Absolutely. Anyway, Peter, I, I've loved speaking to you and I would love for you to come back because my next thing that I would love to talk to you about is, do you think we were seeded by these extraterrestrials? Yep. You know, are we, are we yeah. an experiment? <laughs> well, I, without going into that, I sometimes say, we may be somebody's graduate experiment that has gone horribly wrong, <laughs> and they're getting a very bad grade based on uh, the results they produce. Let's save that for our next show, and I'll be happy to come back as a guest and pick up where we yes, left off. Yes, yes, because believe me, I would love to speak about about that subject with you because uh, y you could say, well, that's science fiction, but at the same time, I think that there's a very good possibility. I do too. Uh, considering that uh, maybe something was happening here on this planet and maybe somebody visited and said, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> or even just a little genetic push here and there. Yeah, exactly. Um, a little tweak here and there. That's right. That's right. We're doing it now with lesser species. Yes, we um, are. And that's kind of scary. So, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it's like, I don't, right. sometimes I wonder if we know what we're doing. Like, well, uh, I couldn't scary. agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. And based on, humanity's growing track record of screwing up in certain areas and the state of the world right now which is something that should cause us all concern yes. uh, one can only wonder Absolutely. but again uh, lots more to talk about in this realm again peter thank you so very much it has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you thank you so much for spending this time today okay 
Glad to, Marlena. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs> I could probably spend three days talking to Peter. <laughs> what a great guest. God, he's wonderful. I'm telling you, this man, I, I'm not kidding. I'm, I mean, you guys know that I have a lot of guests, and of course, I always bring up the bios. I'm not exaggerating. I, If I had to actually read Peter's entire bio of his background, uh, what he's worked on, his areas of studies, I, it would have probably taken me about five minutes, I mean, straight, just to go through all of it. So I, you know, I chopped it because I said, I don't want to lose this time from the interview. But he is, and, and one of the things, and, and I love that, and you, you guys know that I'm into the research. Yes, I love open-ended possibilities, but I still like when people bring uh, theories, hypotheses, what, whatever. It's like, okay, you came up with this based on what? I mean, maybe you haven't reached the conclusion yet. Maybe it's in the process, like what we were talking about. There's no definitive answers. But to get to the point where you're at right now, you got there because of this, based on these observations, reports, investigations, um, hard facts, medical research, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, versus, well, hmm, you know, one day I had nothing to do with it. I believe in research. Um, and sometimes research leads you in one direction and then you get more information and it pulls you in another, which by the way, we we're talking about because sometimes people, especially in certain areas, which uh, are questioned, uh, they come up with a theory or with a, uh, you know, the way it is. And then when new evidence comes forward, that's contrary to what they claimed or the, the, the conclusion that they arrived at, or that they say, this is probably going to be like that, then they just don't go there. And the true researcher wants to research, but is not afraid of coming up with something new that either confirms their prior findings or says, man, I was wrong about that. And, and, you, and you have to say, hey, I'm sorry. Up to this point, based on what I had found, I thought that this is what this was but now I have found this why not but it, but unfortunately you know usually what gets in, in the way of that is big egos but anyway again uh, I uh, he was a splendid guest he's very knowledgeable he's very well versed he's been doing this for a long long time and the cherry on the top is he had his own first-hand experience that, by the way, a lot of researchers in UFO, ufology and have never, they, they've researched, by the way, they might be excellent researchers, but they've never had their first-hand experience with this. Uh, he had it. He had it. And he handled it differently than his sister. Obviously, their experiences were close, but... You know, from what he's saying, he, he was not abducted. Maybe the one that they wanted all along was his sister. And he just happened to be there at the same moment. But a lot of people don't have that. And I'm not kidding. There's a lot of people uh, that exactly like what he described. They haven't even been abducted. But they've had a sighting, a very clear sighting of something like he said that you go through that checklist of what it could be and even as a kid as a teenager come on and somehow or other yes absolutely when you're a teenager there's a lot of really important things like dating the opposite sex whatever whatever that take up your time but still what he did with that memory that total oblivion of that memory that wasn't just because he was a teenager that was because Maybe at that time, he just, it, it would have overwhelmed him. And people do that. People will do that temporarily and sometimes forever. 
depending on your psychological makeup, depending on what's happened to you later in life, where recovering the memory of that experience, for lack of a better word, is just too traumatic. Uh, and that which I'm glad he answered what was happening with him as to why after 14 years he suddenly recovered that memory all at once and thankfully his sister excuse me uh, re, you know she had remembered all along and I'm going to tell you something his sister must have felt more than once that there this was something that was never talked about again. She must have felt from him that the, you know, when the door comes down and it was like, Hey, I know. And I remember, but it's not the same for him, at least not now. And that's exactly, that's how that happens for people. Sometimes it takes them years and years, sometimes never at all. Sometimes they have a moment where everything just, something triggers them. Other people start having dreams. Weird dreams, they think, at the beginning. Very vivid dreams. Uh, or then little by little, certain memories start filtering back. And then they start doing research and maybe they start talking to family members, whatever the circumstances are. But uh, yeah, I, the, the, our mind is there to protect us, to keep us functioning. And that's sometimes why people have those episodes of forgetfulness, if you want to call it. Uh, and I'm sure that there's a lot of people walking around out there that if they haven't been abducted, have seen things, and they put it some away in some deep pocket of their mind and uh, some of them at some point take it out and examine it and like I said think about it like what happened with his sister that she was plucked up taken up examined being told telepathically we love you and we care for you we're not going to hurt you while at the same time hurting her Okay, now, regardless of whether you're male, female, whatever, man, woman, child, this experience has got to be the ultimate experience of helplessness, of being overpowered, whatever the intentions of these ETs were, whatever. Was it just studying us, just observing us? Bottom line, as cognizant beings, even as a child, this is the ultimate act of being helpless. And I think for all living things, especially humans, this puts us, um, for lack of a better word, at the level of the lab rat. They can be kind and nice to us and pat us on the head. I'm not going to hurt you while poking you. Oh, and by the way, we might do this once or on and off. You never know. Talk about a head game. Talk about trying to... How, how do you live a regular normal life as in going to work or going to school, uh, relationships, everything that surrounds us with that knowledge or that fear, because let's face it, that I could, I could be picked up and be examined again. If, you know, if I come up on the list, let me tell you something, that, is something that's really, really difficult for most human beings to wrap their heads around. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Hollywood land just to give you an idea. Um, you know, the, the, the alien series, uh, that they did the, 
basically prequels to the original Alien series with, you know, Ripley and everything, which is Prometheus and the, I think it was Alien Covenant. And in, you know, one of the characters is a very human-like robot called David. Okay. And if you follow some of the storyline, which gets kind of convoluted, David at some point is manufactured to be so human-like in feelings. I mean, not only in appearance, but emotionally. Basically, they've given emotional intelligence to a machine that it dislikes so much being in service as a servant or being having to be bound to the will of a human that it actually revolts and causes, spoiler alert, you know, the destruction of an entire crew that had gone out to try to find the origins of humanity. And of course, a later version of that David robot is much more, very human-like, but still they realize, mm, that's not good to make it. My point being that one of the things about us humans is that we have a real hard time with being used or being thought of as either slaves or, or, or chattel. It does something to us up here. Now think of it, think of that, that if you were ever an abductee with memories of that, you know, what, what is your reality like? What is your reality like from uh, when you realize that you can be manipulated and picked up by uh, a life form that is so far advanced than anything on earth that where do you hide out? Where do you go? What do you do? Yeah, food for thought. But anyway, guys, I hope you like this show. I'm hoping to be... Peter was kind enough and to share this time, and I'm hoping to bring him back on because I do want to talk to him about uh, the flip side of that. You know, maybe that Roswell crash was like modern UFO, uh, ufology, but maybe we go back hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of years uh, into the earliest... You know what? You know were were we seated? What were they? Was there a an extraterrestrial hand that jumped us from being a primate type of animal? That, by the way, was basically at the at the at the mercy of carnivores. You know, predators. You know, the best we could do the the best we could do was run and be able to climb up a tree if that was a case or whatever. Were they the ones that tweaked us or genetically modified us or did something? And, you know, before you knew it, they had Neanderthals and what evolved into modern human beings. <laughs> this this area is, can go off in so many directions. Again, guys, thank you for being part of my audience. Please don't forget to go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Uh, so you can uh, either submit your true story if you have one, whatever it might be. Uh, also, you can send me an email at marlene at miamicoastchronicles.com. You can find us on all the podcast platforms, speakers, iHeartRadio, Spotify. You'll find us there at miamicoastchronicles.com. And again, um, I welcome any recommendations, uh or suggestions that you might have for either subject matter or guests that you would like me to bring on. I have a slew of fantastic guests already lined up and I will start production very soon on season seven, season seven of Stories of the Supernatural. Uh, also check out my last book that uh, is available at MiamiGhostChronicles.com and on Amazon that just came out in December, which is Supernatural Safety. A paranormal DIY guide and I just started a new series called Supernatural Storytime which is a retelling of true I don't want to say they're only ghost stories it's just any type of stories that people have had encounters secondhand stories but I always ask for you my true believers to send me uh, retelling them you know uh, some are short some are longer some are more detailed 
some you understand why it happened and what ended and just it's just an episode in people's lives why they're living at a certain place or just something that happened to them all very interesting again thank you for sharing this time with me you're all wonderful